Well, good morning, all of you. And we finally got Mark here and on the screen. And I'd like to welcome all of you to a fine arts presentation on music making at Hope College. And thank you so much to Dr. Mark Baer for presenting um, for us today. Dr. Baer received his BA from Iowa State University and his MIS and PhD degrees from the University of Iowa. He taught history at Hope for 33 years and his research focused on cultural, social, and political history of Britain as well as Christianity in modern Britain. And while teaching at Hope, he also wrote three books and published many articles in academic journals. He retired for the first time in 2016, but was called back as the interim Dean for Arts and Humanities for a year, after which he retired. But then he was called back to chair the music department as an interim. And then he retired again in um, 2020. And so far, um, that one has stuck. But who knows, huh, Mark? Um, in addition to all this, he had um, a brief career as an actor, um, playing the historian in Mark Milt Newsma's first Making of American Trilogy. Um, and he has also written three books while he was teaching and doing research. And he has recently um, completed his fourth book um, called Making Music at Hope College Music Department. So he's going to share with us information um, that he obtained while writing this book. So thank you so much, Mark, and let's um, go to you. Thank you, Marty. I, I just need to say that I, I was such a terrible actor. <laughs> the first episode of Inventing America that I fired myself because I was helping organize the second and third episodes and hired Fred Johnson, who was a much better actor than I can ever be. So my, you're right, I had a very brief acting career. So uh, thanks, Marty, for that introduction. And I noticed uh, when I saw the screen that there were a few people uh, online who uh, very graciously helped me uh, with questions I had and their insights when they were students, music students at Hope. So thank all of you. So I'm going to uh, talk this morning and then next week uh, from the research that I did with a Hope grad, uh, Allison Udding, class of 18. And so she and I uh, did some research and then uh, published this book called Making Music, Hope College's Music Department of History. And if I have whetted your appetite and you want to drill way down in, into music in the first 150 years of Hope College's history, then that's the place to go. So um, let me start with the book's thesis which is that I think unique among academic units at Hope, music made the department not the other way around. In other words, the department didn't create music, music created the department. And uh, by the end of our time together this morning, I'd like to know whether you think I made that point well or not. So what I'll do today is to discuss how the music department evolved at Hope, and then I want to finish with how some key faculty and students are crucial to the story. And then I'll come back, uh, Lord willing, next uh, Monday and talk about the really curious physical journey of music across that century and a half across Hope's campus, and then finish up with uh, the relationship between the city of Holland and the surrounding area and the uh, college in terms of making music in this part of the world. So um, Susan mentioned uh, or raised the point about questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you weigh in at any point along the way if something's unclear and you wanna ask a question. I will pause partway through and see if there are any small questions at that point, but then I've, I'm hoping that 
Uh, and this is a danger with the professor because once we get a class, we just keep talking, don't we? <laughs> um, I, I'm hoping to leave a good amount of time at the end uh, for uh, discussion or uh, lengthy questions and answers and that sort of thing. So I'm calling today's first foray into this why music. And I'll begin with the series of plot twists that ended up creating a music department, how that came about. So when Allie and I began our research, we thought we were pretty sure about one thing, and that is the year the music department became a department. And that was 1947, of course. The problem was the deeper we got into the sources that we read in the joint archives, the clearer it was to us that we were asking the wrong question. And so a much better question than when was, well, what is a department? And why did music become a department? So like my guess is a lot of you who are my age, and I'm a fellow Hass member, so I'm, I'm guessing your ages. Uh, I was introduced to higher education in the 1960s. And that's when I had my first experience of what an academic department was. As Marty said, uh, the history department at, at Iowa State. If I count that department, my PhD department, the two schools I taught at before Hope and Hope, then, then I've experienced five different history departments. And unfortunately for me then, I had a pretty clear idea of, let me call it departmentness. And by, and by that, I mean a sense of what a department is. It's in a particular building, you know which building to go to if you wanna find chemistry or uh, philosophy uh, or uh, French say, and uh, you know who to call and complain to. You know who the head of the department or the chair of the department is. Uh, he has in fact very little power. Power really resides in the secretary or office manager. That's the person you wanna to talk to. She has a phone number. The department has stationery with its name printed on it. You get, you get kind of my, my uh, point here. So when I asked, when did music officially become a department? it turns out that I was violating the rule that I used to teach freshmen on the first day of class. Don't go by your experience. Don't impose yourself on the past. Don't think that people in the past were exactly like you because they weren't. They couldn't have been. Um, read documents and listen to them. So I think the key moment came about a month into our work. Uh, I had been reading the college newspaper, the student newspaper, the anchor. I'd been reading uh, the milestones, hope catalogs, other sources. And that's when I realized that my definition of department wasn't true for Hope College for the first hundred years or so, based on my own experience. It turns out that that word department at Hope has had way too many meanings. Uh, in the early days, that word department referred to one of the divisions of the college. So back in the beginning, Hope had a preparatory school and a high school, and um, that was the preparatory department. Then there was the collegiate department. That's what we would think of as Hope College. And then there was the theological department. And in 1885, that hived itself off and became Western Theological Seminary. So department could be a division, but department could also be a curriculum leading to a certification. So the normal department, we would today call it education, led to its students being certified to teach. But that's not the end of it. Department could also be gender specific. So there was something called the female department. Or, and I said there were twists and turns, it could be an academic program that supported what we would call a major, but early on was called a course. So the Department of Biology 
provided offerings for Hope's scientific course. And then just to add to the confusion, in terms of music, there could be, as I'll show you in a few moments, departments within departments. So that, that term, what is a department, uh, is really the question that I should have been thinking about from the very beginning. So let's go back then to the 19th century from about the 1880s on, so a couple of decades into uh, the history of hope, there began a debate about music's identity. The key issue being, was music something that just happened like sports? Uh, we would call it an extracurricular activity. That's a 20th century term, but that's, that's essentially what it was. And, and from the very first day uh, at Hope College, music was that. And then the other way of understanding it, well, should it become an academic program? That is to say, leading to a major. So in the 1890s, there was a new young faculty member whose name was John Nykirk, and he, he entered into that conversation about what music should be. Um, Nykirk was a Hope College graduate. He was not a musician. He was not professionally trained. He was not academically trained, but he had a wonderful singing voice. He loved music. He loved singing and was, was passionate about music at Hope. So in the early 20th century, he got President Garrett Collin to invite a part-time instructor to show up at a college faculty meeting. And this guy whose name was Mr. Post made a presentation and I just wanna work us through it. This is a report of that faculty meeting. Uh, Mr. Post spoke very hopefully about the opportunities Holland offers for the development of a conservatory of music he urged the desirability of establishing a definite course or courses, both of vocational and instrumental work and of determining on definite credits for such work. He explained what immediate facilities were needed in the line of a couple of studios or rooms and expressed the hope that there soon might be established a closer affiliation between Hope College and the work of his colleagues and himself in the direction of the establishment of a department of vocal and instrumental music. From that presentation emerged, not a department, but something called the College School of Music, which was a solution that in fact postponed a decision about why music. And so in the first half of the 20th century, College School of Music and Department of Music were used as synonyms. Sometimes somebody used one term, sometimes they use the other term. They meant the same thing, but she's, you notice the difficulty of language here. What exactly was this entity? Was it a conservatory connected to the college? Was it a department within the college? What was it? The value of this arrangement, this to me, it seems vague and confusing, but I'm sure it wasn't at the time, is evident in a report in 1905 of the college faculty to the college council. We would now call the college council the board of trustees. And here's what that report contained. The college school of music has during the past year almost doubled in attendance. The school proves to be a very popular and useful feature of the college curriculum which of course it was not. As a local advertising scheme, which of course it was, a faculty recital and a pupil's musicale were given during the past year. So in 1905, when that report was made, there were 73 students in the School of Music. 53 of them were townies. So the vast majority were not Hope College students at all. And then the remaining 20 were more or less evenly divided between Hope College students and preparatory school students. A decade later, that is to say 1915, the milestone made the value of the arrangement explicit. Hope's music department attracts large numbers of students from neighboring towns 
as well as from the city and college itself. So I read that is as the Department of Music forward slash the conservatory was a cash cow. One not requiring the college to give it any kind of standing like other departments, official departments, much less to hire any full-time resident academically trained faculty. And the two of those go together. So this set the table for half a century. There was no need to make music a full-fledged academic department because the School of Music was so beneficial to the college financially. In the November 1919 Hope College Bulletin, which was an official college publication sent to prospective high school students, um, it promoted the School of Music as a remarkable and affordable opportunity. And I've highlighted some key phrases. This is a long quotation, but it's really helpful because it, it, it is a way of understanding what was going on. And I've, I've highlighted some things that I think are critical. Uh, it is a source of gratification to report that the School of Music is beginning to occupy a large place in the program of the student body. Hope College has always offered the highest type of instruction in the several departments of music. There it is, departments within a department. And the present faculty is no exception to this rule. In addition to the courses offered in voice, violin and piano, Mr. Harold Tower of Grand Rapids offers instruction in organ and harmony. The prestige and reputation gained by Mr. Tower as an artist and performer gives him a place among the leading musicians in Western Michigan. Notice, he's not an academic, he's not full time. He's a musician in Grand Rapids and so he's going back and forth, however one did that in 1919. He's not really grounded in the college. He has prestige and reputation, but he's an artist. The students at the college are showing a manifest interest in matters pertaining to musical appreciation, and all possible is done to foster a distinct musical atmosphere. Not an academic department. Two splendid glee clubs, one for the young men and the other for the young women, are meeting weekly under the direction of Mr. Harold Tower. An excellent orchestra has been organized under the conductorship of Mr. Bruno Meineke. These several organizations will appear in concert at intervals throughout the year. And special effort is being used to produce programs of unquestioned merit. With the wealth of material that the college possesses, the outlook is most encouraging. It was a wonderful sales pitch from Hope to high school students it was also like almost all propaganda, mostly not true. So there was not a single member of the music faculty who was full-time or resident in Holland, except for Bruno Meineke, who was not a professor of music. He was a professor of Latin and he did music on the side. And I wanna show you a picture of that excellent orchestra. You count with me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> a borrowed drum set, a couple of violins, excellent. Well, maybe it was, it's also pretty small as orchestras go. And, you know, maybe small is beautiful, but I, I don't think that that November 1919 document is very accurate in terms of what was actually going on. Then in 1925, the college made a decision to create a music major via a new degree, a Bachelor of Music. And that was something that was happening around the country in the 1920s, this Bachelor of Music. That year, the anchor, the student newspaper announced a little too enthusiastically, a most capable faculty has been secured and the conferring of the degree of Bachelor of Music has been a great step forward in the history of Hope College. The only problem with the anchor's interpretation was the same old problem that had existed for, at this point, decades. 
the absence of any full-time faculty dedicated to the music program. So if you go to the milestone of 1925 and look at the eight faculty listed, John Nykamp no longer taught any music. He taught English and he was also the Dean of Men, so he didn't have any time to teach music. And of the remaining seven, they were all part-time instructors. Very few of them lived in Holland. And thus they were not drawn to the college and its students, but drawn to their career as professional musicians to, out, to outside. And of those seven, two years later, four of them were gone. So you see my point that, that there wasn't anything like a stable department of music. There wasn't a department of music at all, in my opinion, but there certainly wasn't like any other department where there were full-time professors examining students and that sort of thing. So as important as music was at Hope, and I'll talk more about this in a few moments, as well as next week. In this era, the college leadership would not commit to hiring a critical mass of full-time permanent musical music faculty. And as a result, the program simply wasn't sustainable, even in the best of times. With the coming of the Great Depression following the stock market crash of 1929, like colleges across the country, Hope found itself in the worst of times. And so in the 1930s, the Board of Trustees decided to maintain the music major, but eliminate the Bachelor of Music degree because there simply weren't the resources to support it. And also in the 1930s, the college closed the preparatory school, which had been an important source of students for the School of Music. So in 1940, the School of Music was wound down and thereafter in college publications, it was replaced with the term department. Except there was still this problem of language. And so I wanna show you two programs. These are both from June, 1940, June 6, 1940, Hope College School of Music. And then there's the program. Three days earlier, Hope College Music Department. So that problem of language, was it a conservatory, was it a department, continued. And in fact, as late as 1945, President Lovers used the term College School of Music in a letter to a music faculty member. Of course, he had been a student at Hope. And my thinking is he just subconsciously continued to think about this college school of music, which didn't exist anymore. By the end of World War II, 1945, the music program at the college was barely hanging on, at one point comprising just three part-time faculty. In the Hope graduating class of 1945, numbering 64, there was just a single music major. So I, I think if you're standing in 1945 or so, uh, music as an academic program is dying out. But it wasn't. So the next year, 1946, the college added a six standing committee called the Music Committee, which was not another, another synonym for music department, but was created, and, I, and the language here is really interesting, to further the development of music on the campus. So that's that music as an extracurricular activity and to handle the problems that pertain to the music department of the college. They never explained what the problems were, but if we would read between the lines, my guess is the problems were, is this fish or fowl? Is this a department? What exactly is it? Uh, music professor Robert Cavanaugh chaired the committee, but the committee included non-music faculty. So even by the standards of that time, music was still not a typical academic department, if it was a department at all. And then between 1946 and 1950, a very significant set of changes took place. Jantina Holloman joined Hope College in the fall of 1946 to teach music. And she recalled in a 2002 interview, and she's holding up the 1947 milestone as uh, the interview was going on. She said, 
We didn't have a true department, although this is called the Department of Music in this yearbook. Nevertheless, it wasn't really an official music department. We had a music committee, which met once a month. And remember that music committee was chaired by somebody who taught music full time, but it had lots of non-music faculty on it. So it wasn't at all like a department. The first official source that I could find that indicated that in fact, there was a modern department of music is in the Board of Trustees minutes for January, 1950. They never said, and I read all the way back, let's create a music department. But here's what they said in January, 1950. In view of his current leave of absence to continue his studies at the Univers University of Michigan, it was voted to inform Mr. Kavanaugh that he will be appointed head of the Department of Music upon his return to active duty next fall at the salary commensurate with that position. So apparently in January, 1950, somehow there was a music department. So when did it officially become a department? Well, this really pains me as an historian, but I have no idea. And I don't think we'll ever know for sure. And so here's a kind of a soft interpretation. In important ways, student demand, they were always making music as well as requesting opportunities, academic opportunities to make more music and to get college credit for some of their efforts. So student demand, and then some key faculty, especially John Nykirk, early 20th century, and Robert Cavanaugh, mid 20th century, students and these key faculty together had willed the department into existence. So let's say somehow, in some way, I don't know how, and I don't know when to be certain, there is a department of music no later than 1950. And then it went from strength to strength. And I just wanna highlight uh, two developments. First, the faculty issue. How to have a sustainable program by relying upon part-time faculty, which has been the case for, at this point, 90 years. That was solved. As chair, Kavanaugh began, began hiring academically trained full-time music faculty. So that's Kavanaugh in the middle there. Uh, Roger Reitberg is there, uh, Moret Ryder. I don't know who the fourth person is in that, in that photograph. And then as demand for music courses grew after World War II, Kavanaugh began to make the case of still more hires of full-time faculty. So, so the, the department reached a critical mass of faculty who stayed for a long period of time, who were professionally trained as musicians. And then second, the identity issue was solved. In 1958, the department applied for and received accreditation by NASM, the National Association of Schools of Music. And thereafter, the department led the effort to, at the college to reinstitute the Bachelor of Music degree which was significant because a first rate faculty called for a professional major alongside the liberal arts BA in music. That is to say the role of the department was to teach music, but also to train future musicians. And when the department was reaccredited by NASM 10 years later, the visitors, the visitors report praised the music students, quote, they were a clean, well-disciplined group with a minimum of literal long-haired and bearded ones. There was no comment about the music faculty's hairstyle. So Bob Ritzema, Charles Ashbrenner, and Harrison Riker. And, you know, we all look like that in the 1960s, unfortunately. So let me just uh, pause here for a moment. <clears throat> And um, <clears throat> Susan, let us know if there are any questions popped up or any of you could unmute and ask a question. Again, I'll, I'll come back at the end and we'll have some time to uh, delve into things more deeply. But if there are just any, any small questions now, I'm happy to take them. 
I don't see anything in the chat right now. So if you do have a question, just be sure to unmute yourself. And interrupt me. So I, I've spent uh, a lot of time. Can I ask a question? OK, yes, sure. Uh, I was uh, a student at Hope from 56 to 60, and not a music major, but I was in the symphonette from 57 to 60. And uh, so this is the time that Bob Ritzman was there. Um, but he was there a little bit before that. Uh, but the department seemed to exist at that time. I mean, I took lessons from uh, a, 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 a music instructor or a, a, a brass instructor. I was a trombonist. And so uh, I'd be interested to hear the uh, evolution of the symphonette. Uh, I am going to talk about the symphonette next week. If I can go back okay, that's fine. one slide. So it was founded by uh, Maury yep. Wright. Who was there on the on the far right? Um, I will talk about the symphonette, and unfortunately, I will have to kill it off uh, next week when I talk about it. But yeah, by by the late fifties, clearly, music was a department like other departments at at the college. So, um, the nineteen fifties is is probably the key decade for. Uh, music putting down roots as an academic department. And by academic department, I mean the things that, that I described before as departmentness, but I also mean um, a faculty who stayed for a long period of time, uh, as Charles Ashbrenner did, as Bob Ritzema did. Uh, uh, Harrison Riker uh, didn't stay for very long. Uh, Maury Ryder, who founded the Symphonette, stayed for a pretty long time and then became an administrator uh, and then uh, left to become the Dean of the School of Music at, at the University of Oregon. But by the time that you were there, it, it was functioning like any other academic department. Yes, thank you. Okay, any other small points before we go on? So I, I need to apologize for spending so much time talking about the evolution of the department. I'm a former department chair and so, this is really interesting stuff to me. I, I, I wish I would have known in 1983 when I arrived at Hope, kind of how things worked at Hope. I just, you know, like new faculty, I just assumed that it was like any other place and I didn't need to learn the history of it, but we always need to learn the history of, of where we work. So let me recall the thesis. Music made the department, not the other way around. And so, as part of that, from the very beginning of the college, music was everywhere among students, also alumni. And uh, it's pretty hard not to find sources that address that uh, ubiquitous nature of music at home. We as a college have always had an enviable reputation for musical performance, uh, prominence. Music has been part of the heritage of Hope College from its founding in 1862. Uh, so another way to, to say what I just said is, Hope students and faculty constantly were making music long before there was a department that organized the making of music. So where would one see this on the part of students? Well, every student organization that I ran across the YMCA, the YWCA, but especially Greek organizations made music. So this is the Frater Frolics of 1941. This is an annual variety show that that fraternity did. Uh, it was still doing it in the 1950s. I, I don't know about thereafter. And then there were all the ceremonial occasions. There was graduation, there was Arbor Day, there was May Day, there was homecoming. There were annual competitions like the All College Sing and the Nykirk Cup competition, named after John Nykirk, of course. But virtually every other event had music connected to it. The pull, the annual day of prayer in the early 20th century, or most importantly, the most important thing that happens at Hope College is, of course, basketball games. So there's music being made at basketball games in the 1930s, 
and there's music being made at basketball games not so very long ago. And then every time a new president arrived, a new building was dedicated, uh, a dignitary passed through Holland and there was some kind of convocation for her or him, there would be music. From 1916 to 1966, every 10 years to celebrate uh, that first graduating class, there were pageants. Here is the pageant of 1926. There were lots of student initiated ensembles uh, like the Hope College Quartet of 1919, also called the Baker Prince Quartet because it was composed of two young men named Baker and two young men named Prince. And then what was most interesting to me because they connected to my own history was spontaneous singing. So this is outside, that is to say, to the south side of Voorhees Hall. Voorhees Hall was an all-female dorm. And here are some fraternity men serenading them in their PJs. Um, if you were a college student and in, in a fraternity like I was in the 1960s, we didn't do it in our PJs. But every week, we showed up at some sorority and we serenaded them. Whether, and pledges of course had to go, whether they could sing or not. And I, I was in that sad category of being unable to sing, but I could stand next to people who could. Here's a 1927 diary entry of one of the Voorhees residents, Millie Schubert, who recalled going to a friend's room one evening. Quote, we had a lovely time talking and singing hymns. And then as you read through her diaries on lots of occasions before she graduated in 1931, Millie and other Voorhees women went down to the lounge where there was a piano and they sang. And that trend continued until at least the 1960s. So why was music everywhere at Hope during the college's first hundred years? The answer is I think because almost all students had some connection to music. So in the late 19th, early 20th century, they either learned music at home or they learned it in school and they brought that with them and it was part of who they were. In 1936, the college conducted a survey of the musical abilities of the 152 incoming Hope freshmen. And from that survey, 70% could sing, could really sing, unlike me. And over 60% could play at least one instrument and a lot of students could play two or three instruments. So it's no wonder to me, it's perfectly natural that students were making music all the time, everywhere. It was a pretty important component of their identity. Now, Clearly, the Department of Music organized some of this. For example, and I'll talk about this next week in more detail. Uh, beginning in the early 20th century and continuing until the 1970s, every year at Hope, there was a production of the Messiah uh, around Christmas time. And then of course, uh, subsequently there was Christmas Vespers. So these, these were examples of music being organized by the department. And then every year there were scores of recitals by faculty and students and lots of guest artists. Like the pageants or the performances during tulip time, a lot of these were for and often with the local community. And that's a story that I'll come back to and talk about next week. But the most important work at the in the college's first century in terms of making music had to do with students. So as my thesis, you remember what that was, right? Music made the department, not the other way around. Music making at Hope in the college's first century was bottom up rather than top down in the main, which helps explain endless editorials in the student newspaper, The Anchor, 
in support of making music. A department, a major, more opportunities, more ensembles, more places where music could be made. And so in this, students found faculty who shared a passion for expanding the music program, beginning with John Nykirk in the 1890s, Curtis Snow in the 1930s, Robert Cavanaugh in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, Bob Ritzema, who looks much more like we do now, uh, and Joan Conway in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then to the end of our story. So to go back to my answer to that one question, I think the 1950s is, is a pretty important moment with some faculty hires and extended on into the 1960s that produced a critical mass of professionals who performed at, and taught at the very highest level. And so here comes a turning point. Because they were professionals, they responded to national rather than local expectations embodied in that accreditation by the National Schools of Music. And thus they took over from students, most of whom were not music majors, the creation, the making of music on Pope's campus. So it's a move as we go forward from the 50s and 60s to the present, it's a move away from the first nine or 10 decades in the college's history towards a top down rather than a bottom up. And that development complemented another one, which was a declining musicality among college students. So I saw that anecdotally, I, I did a little survey because I was interested in the demise of the all, all college sing, and I'll talk about that next week, uh, which was this yearly event, very popular. It, it, it was probably the single most important musical moment in the calendar at Hope College happened uh, in April. And I wondered why it disappeared. And so I conducted a little survey. I, I emailed uh, four men who had been in fraternities and four women who had been in sororities. And I asked them about singing at their time at Hope College. And, about, and I, was, I was looking for clues about the decline of that. So I asked him, and here are the two poles of answer. There is Jim Bolton. He is in the second row far right, class of 1963, a frauder. So I emailed Jim, and I asked him if he could remember the frauder song. And he said, of course I can. Do you want me to sing it for you? And then I emailed my son, Brett, who was in the class of 19... 94, a Cosmo. And I asked him about the, his fraternity song and his response was, did the Cosmos have a song? Now, I don't have a picture of the Cosmos from the 1994 milestone because I looked at it and it's so embarrassing. It doesn't look at all like this. Those of you who had sons who were at Hope in the 1990s, you can feel my pain. So I'm not gonna show you a picture of that. Uh, but, but clearly something happened between the 60s and the 90s. And although my survey was not very scientific, uh, it's supported by real research that academics have done about what happened to music on college and university campuses in, in that era, the last third of the 19th century, uh, of the 20th century. So there was a, 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 a recent national survey which reported on participation in ensembles on college campuses in the early 21st century. And it showed that just 15% of college students participated in them. So a real change from that survey uh, of Hope students in the 1930s. Why this was the case was really revealing to me. 
the students sense they didn't have the time to do music. That is to say, to participate in an extracurricular activity. And I took that as code for, we choose to spend our time doing other things. And so in one generation, in fact, less than a generation, making music had ceased to be an important component of the identity of college students. Even while at Hope College, the music program found its identity in an academic department with the full-time faculty, professionals staying here for long enough to put down deep roots. So I'll end on that point today and um, curious about what you thought of my thesis and uh, happy to answer any questions or listen to any insights that you have. Don't forget to unmute yourself when you ask a question. Thank you, Mark. Um, I don't see anything in the chat currently. But I'm sure we have some questions. Could I uh, just comment on, on the 50s era again? I was an Arcadian and we sang the, in the all college sing uh, very uh, avidly. And I believe we won it one year with Harley Brown conducting us singing Gigi. But I did play in the, uh, I was a, a, sci a science major, but I played in the, uh, as I said, in the symphonet and the orchestra and the band. And I must say most of the students who played in those uh, ensembles I don't think we're, we're actually music majors. Uh, I have a, uh, I had a son who was in, the, uh, in college in the 80s and he was a clarinet major at the University of Colorado. And all the ensembles in which he played uh, were populated by only music majors. Mm -hmm. That's a larger college, of course, but uh, I understand what, what you're saying about the, the change over, the over time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks to Harley, I have a, a great picture which I'll show you next week of the Arcadians uh, practicing for the all college sing. So you're going to have to uh, just wait for a whole week for that image. Uh, I'm sure I was in the picture of the 1958 uh, Vespers as well. Okay. In the orchestra. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I suspect that the, the pattern at hope of ensembles being populated by non-music majors. So I think about the orchestra, for example, or chapel choir, it has to do with the history of it. That is to say, long before there was a major, there were these ensembles, vocal and instrumental. And so, um, if Hope were a larger place, and you said University of Colorado, so that's probably 30,000 students as opposed to 3,000 students, then it would be possible to, to say an ensemble is only for music majors, but that's never been the case in the history of Hope. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're the better for it. Exactly. Yes. Uh -huh. I was um, at Hope in the 60s, and you talk about the popularity of fraternity singing. When a girl got pinned, the fraternity that her boyfriend went to would come and serenade um, for the pinning ceremony. Yes, indeed. And the same happened at Iowa State. <laughs> Well, there was a lot of singing because there was a lot of pinning. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, Peg Van Grau. Hi, Peg. Couple of questions. First of all, thank you. This has been most interesting. You mentioned in passing that students in the earlier years would come to Hope with music through their school or their home backgrounds. What about the church? And the other question, may I assume that you're going to be talking about the reduction, if not demise, of created singing and created music at the college is largely due to the commercial invasion of music of all nature. 
So let me let me address the second one. I'll go back to that survey that I reported on. Only 15% of students in higher education in the 2010s were part of ensembles. And they said, we don't have the time. Now, I think they were listening to music. Mm -hmm. That was my point. But it was, exactly. But it was passive rather than active. They weren't right. making music. Right. And so the more opportunities they had to listen, listen to music. Uh, we were listening to Spotify yesterday and they had this obnoxious add on because of course we have the free Spotify rather than paying for it because I'm cheap. Uh, this woman kept saying over and over again, uh, we're so glad that you're on Spotify and not listening to an eight track tape as if anybody in 2021 will listen to an eight track tape. Uh, but, but there it is, right? I don't need to make music because I just click on Spotify and pick James Taylor and listen to James Taylor for an hour. It's so easy now. And yes, you're exactly right. It is the commercialization and, you know, in our own time, the digitalization of music that has made it too easy to be consumers rather than producers to be passive rather than active. Uh, your first question, the church. So uh, I confess, Peg, that I was a pagan until I was 25, so I did not grow up in the church. And I don't know about whether churches so much taught music as did music, that is to say, they drew students to them. And I'll talk a little bit about this next week as well, because that's a pretty important uh, part of the relationship between the college and the community. It's hope students doing music in churches, but I think they, they brought their skill set with them to the church, whether it was a companyness, piano, organ, whether it was in a choir, uh, whether it was special music or something like that, as opposed to as opposed to the church um, teaching them in the way that their parents would have at home, around the piano, uh, or the schools would have. Does, does that make sense? Thank you. And I think probably a lot of us grew up starting early, even preschoolers singing in a Sunday school setting, and then you just became part of the junior choirs and eventually the senior choirs. So it wasn't a quality singing necessarily. Yeah. And there was limited instruction. It was a participation. But it was a, was a pretty important part of the student's identity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a way that I think for most students it has ceased to be. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? You know, I, I am a retired professor, but I'm still a professor. So <laughs> I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you all, uh, do you think the thesis makes sense given what I presented? That, that unlike, unlike any other department at the college, uh, and the one place where I might hesitate for a moment is athletics, kinesiology today. Uh, it was the making of music that made the department long before there was a department to organize the making of music. Do you think, do you think that made sense given what I presented? Yes. I hadn't given any thought to it before, but now that you've brought it to my attention, I would certainly think it makes sense, especially as you have presented it. Thank you, Peg. <laughs> You've always been one of my great supporters. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with Peg. Uh-huh. Okay, anyone else? Earlier in your presentation, you had the uh, shot, the photo from the early 1950s of the four professors, Kavanaugh, I think you had Rietberg and Ryder in there. Mm -hmm. And I think you said you didn't recognize the other one. Right. Um, I was just wondering if it might have been uh, Tony Koiker. It was not Tony Koiker. Oh, it was not. Okay. 
pretty sure it was not. Yeah, I, 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 I knew Tony. Uh, and in the book, I have a, a picture of him. So I don't think that was Tony Koiger. Mark, to just go back to our earlier conversation about commercialization, don't you think that there's also an element of comparison? Um, when we didn't hear a lot of professional musicians on the radio, and of course it was all pre-television and all the other developments since, we could be content to sing at our own level. And you've talked about your own feeling about yourself. I think people who try now compare themselves to the professionals that they hear all the time and just don't want to try. I hope that comes back. <laughs> In other words, I hope it comes back that they will try even if they don't compare themselves favorably to the professionals who are yeah. being paid. I don't know if their quality is all that much better sometimes, but. Yeah, no, there's a lot of truth to that. I, and I think, so there's a trend line that begins with radio in the 20s, television in the 50s, and the internet 90s, aughts, 10s, that there is so much opportunity to listen to outstanding music that you're in hip one is inhibited as opposed to, you know, when Holland was founded, it was on the frontier in 1847. And there was no one else to listen to until, you know, some musician from out of town showed up. Uh, but those were, those were relatively rare until more like the 1880s and 1890s. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't know I couldn't sing very well. And that was a blessing. You were active. You weren't passive at that point. Well, in your singing, I was also a pledged, a pledge, and forced to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Once I became an active, I stayed as far away from that as possible. But no, I, 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 I did, in fact, participate. It's always good to stand next to somebody who has a beautiful voice, which is why I stand next to my wife. Okay, anyone else? Hey, okay. hey, Mark. Yes. This is Elka. Hi, Elka. I've been thinking about the fact that when we grew up, generation after generation had a core of American songs that you learned in school that crossed the generations. So mm -hmm. he said, you know, I've been working on the railroad, everybody knew it. And other than hymns in church today, we don't have that. The elementary schools don't teach those same core songs that were kind of part of history, plus the patriotic songs. And I right. think that's a big problem too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I have a confession to make. I, well, I have two confessions actually. One is I watched the Super Bowl yesterday and was very gratified that an old guy did so well. Uh, but I also watched the halftime and I'd never heard of that guy before. So uh, it, yes, the proliferation of music. So there's, there was an, uh, there was a kind of a standard, what was the, what's the phrase? American, um, American songbook or something like that, that everybody knew those songs. They, they were universal and now that's gone. So depending on your age cohort, you know some songs very well, some a little bit and some not at all. You know, so I mentioned listening to James Taylor. Well, that dates me, right? <laughs> My, my guess is none of my three children have ever heard of James Taylor, much less listened to his music. So we've, 
we it's one of the sad things of our time, right? We have split ourselves off into these little islands of listening to music and and we don't we're not familiar with with all the other but that's that's um the blessing that came through the media uh, again radio and television and then the internet okay any any last comments or questions? If there are no more questions, maybe we should um, adjourn for the day and look forward to your presentation, Mark, for uh, continuing on music making at hope for next week, same time, same channel. <laughs> um, I really liked the photographs that you had. I liked looking at those and um, thinking back to my time at Hope. And I want to say that I was a Delphi and the Delphi's won the all college sing at um, one point when I was there singing. Um, these are a few of my favorite things. So that's my pitch for sorority. Um, so can we say thank you and maybe give you uh, an applause and have a good day and we'll see you next week, same time, same station. Thank you, Marty. Bye-bye, everyone. Mark. Thanks, Marty. Everybody have a nice day. Be safe in the snow. Thank you. Mark, that was wonderful, and I'm glad it worked out with Jeremy. Thank you for uh, working through all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad my computer started working better. So what do I do now? So I will, uh, I can stop sharing your screen, or you can by, uh, well, I just did for you. Thanks. And I can actually just end the class, but that will, uh, that will end our connection as well. So if you have no other questions, I'll see you next week and I will see you in person because I will be out of quarantine. Okay, and great. And, and should I come half an hour early again next week just to be safe? Sure, if you feel comfortable. I mean, I'll be there, I'll be there by nine or earlier. So okay. can, I, come can I ask him a quick question? Oh, for sure. I'm sorry, uh, many people went to a music school for a particular professor rather than the college itself, okay? Right. So uh, is, was that true during your day or so, do you recall it? Like if you were a good pianist uh, and Dr. So-and-so was a professor at the music school, uh, you would wanna go there and study with that person rather than be concerned about the, the importance of the whole college, if you will. Right. So Does that make any sense to you? So once the Bachelor of Music degree was reinstated in the 1950s, and once uh, the college saw its way clear to hiring professionally trained, academically trained uh, music professors who uh, who had national reputations. And so uh, you mentioned piano. So there's Tony Koiker, there's Joan Conway, there's Charles Ashburner. I'll show you a picture next week of Drew Elliott. Okay. Um, no, not, I'm sorry, Drew Lee. Um, then yes, indeed, students came for that one person because they were gonna get a Bachelor of Music degree in piano performance. Right with the idea of having a career as a pianist, as opposed to coming to the music department or even coming to Hope College. So it was professor to department to college, mm -hmm. not the other way. Okay. Whereas I think in my old department history, it was the other way. They came to the college uh, and they, studied history, and maybe they connected to a, a single professor or two. Mm -hmm. But music is quite different in that regard. Right, okay. And the same would apply to voice too. If you had an excellent voice, you might want to study with a voice and professor. 
Okay, thanks a lot. Sorry to bump in here no, at the no, end. No, but, no. Uh, here to answer questions. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Good job. Mark, Mark, here's a question for you. How was your drive in this morning? Uh, <laughs> kind of scary? It, it was fun. Um, <laughs> I know. I thought about you uh, when I saw the snow and thought, oh my gosh, you've got to drive into town. Once I got onto Ottawa Beach Road, it was okay. Where um, were you coming from? Well, I, I told you I, I live in Idlewood Beach. Oh, that's right. You live up. Uh, that is dying. First down the hill. That's always a <laughs> yeah. good <laughs> and then Perry, remembering to slow down and oh. stop at the top of Perry before I go down to that intersection, yes. so slide through it. And then, of course, Perry is snowpacked because of the trees. So, so once I got onto Ottawa Beach Road, it was okay. Well, I'm hoping next week will be better, easier <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It is very icy. I had a trailer hitched to my Cherokee yesterday. And we had to move something. And it was a solid sheet of ice all the way up Lakeshore, Lakewood Boulevard. It was only when you got really into town did you really see the salt had taken effect. It was yeah. pretty dicey. So uh, we stayed home from church yesterday and just did it online. I, I didn't leave the house. Yeah. Well, is your church open? Can you go to your church? Uh, yeah. So I go to Pillar and it, it reopened um, three weeks ago, I think. Oh, really? interesting yeah. but it, it's going to continue being online and so it was really handy yeah. go down to the basement where it was warm and curl up and mm -hmm. have a cup of coffee have a <laughs> cup of coffee and watch the service yeah well mark thank you so much and uh, um i appreciate it and i'll see you next week yeah okay. and just an fyi marty uh, in the book i do mention uh, the Delphi's winning the all college sing. I even, oh, yeah. I even talk about what costume they were wearing. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Mark, I didn't want to Bye. have a good day. See you. Mark, I didn't want to interject in class, but I had two funny things. First of all, I was, I graduated in 1993. So I was probably like right before that horrific picture, but I went yeah. to Ohio state and we had a large Greek system and it was very traditional. And I will have to say it was, it was commonplace for our sorority, I was a theta, to be serenaded. And, um, and there was one year where I was honored to be the sweetheart of the beta house. And that was a big deal. And that all, I think there were 200 men that came and stood on our lawn and, and serenade, or, serenaded us so it was I think that some of it might be the culture just in that particular moment in that particular place but it, it was kind of cool to at least have that memory as someone that probably was on the tail end of that kind of um, fun traditional uh, song you know tradition. Yeah, so it, was, it was still there at Ohio State in the 90s yeah okay yeah, I, I just assumed that by the end of the 60s, it had vanished. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall ever hearing about it. I certainly never read about it at Hope. So I came in 83. Um, I think it vanished at Hope sometime around 1980. But I don't, you know, I'm, I'm kind of glad for you that you had the same it's experience. Cool. And I think that I think that regardless of the culture of the music at the time, I mean, hopefully there'll be some, you know, flashback to that and people will get more interested in in doing that because I do think it it for us, for my age group, probably a little bit more nostalgic and feels, you know, kind of capturing, I don't know, some of the things that we probably lost in our generation. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, I think it's important. And I think that maybe we, we will see more of that. Yeah, so, so did the Ohio State Thetas have a piano in the house and did they? We did and we, so I was rush chair and I don't mean since nobody's really, I mean, there are a couple of people still on but I was rush chair one year and I remember I mean, we spent two solid weeks learning harmonies and like doing like a really elaborate production. And my mom was a, 
is a pianist and she came in and played ragtime to, mm. you know, what, I, so yes, we had a grand piano. We, and, but again, part of that, I think, is the culture of the Greek system at Ohio State and kind of like the houses and things like that were very traditional. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I haven't been back in a long time. So that was a long time ago, <laughs> but, but I'm curious if it's still going on. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, thanks for um, indulging me. No, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad to have learned that, that, uh, you know, if I were going to become a, an historian of music in higher education, I would want to explore is what happened at Hope like or unlike what happened in other places? Is the trajectory the same or is it is it peculiar to a particular place? Right. Uh, and my, my guess is uh, at Hope, the fraternities and sororities became less important as setting the tone of the campus mm. in the 1970s and 80s compared to all the way back to the very beginning where they were a really big deal and they campus life was essentially an extension of Greek life. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas I think they had become marginalized by certainly by the time I arrived. Mm -hmm. And do you think that was just based on the culture in the 70s moving away from some of that organized, I mean, with the war and just like the protests and a lot of um, culture that was moving away from that kind of structure and yeah. authority. Yeah, my wife was uh, a Kappa at the University of Iowa and she was president of her house. So she graduated in 71. Uh, and I, we've talked a lot about this, even in her time at the University of Iowa, 67 to 71, it was changing very rapidly. So lots of women deactivated because they no longer 